Multimedia J Radio Style Theater presents Don't Insult the 222 Bot. Wow, cool, a robot. Is that really all you can say is 222? Wow, what a stupid robot. <laughs> Multimedia J Radio Style. Welcome back, everyone, to Multimedia J Radio Style for Sunday, February 5th, 2017. Last go around, we talked about what's going on at GameStop. But on Super Sunday, I really don't want to leave everything on a down note. Plus, there's more for me to talk about. I'm still not 100% as far as getting over the cold is concerned. However, I do think that I can chime in on a few things here and there, as long as I space things apart, as it were. I think I might finally be beginning to understand why the Intel Sandy Bridge has such a cult following these days. I've recently become aware of the basically hardcore Sandy Bridge gamers out there that are doing everything possible to make the Sandy Bridge, a.k.a. 2011-2012 second-generation Intel processors, last as long as humanly possible. And very interestingly enough, when I was actually looking at Intel's marketing material when deciding to put together the Skylake system for Monolith, very, very interesting, Intel kept referencing five-year-old systems, which would have been Sandy Bridge in those days. So, or Sandy Bridge, or the original, the original i-series, or something along those lines, but... Sandy Bridge, for whatever reason, even more so than Ivy Bridge and Haswell, seems to be the processor generation that I keep finding folks trying to make last as long as humanly possible. So for the longest time, I didn't understand this. And then I started looking around on eBay after watching a few videos about folks building console killer PCs by basically upgrading corporate surplus machines that they found on eBay. And you look on eBay these days, Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge. Because if a company has a five-year life cycle rule, there's going to be Sandy Bridge stuff all over the corporate surplus that's floating around the second-hand PC market. We may start seeing Ivy Bridge in this rotation as well, but basically you just look around at old computers and you're going to find either Core 2 era, which will be the cheapest of course, but they might come up short on processing power nowadays for anything related to gaming, but then Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge. The picture that I'm actually using for this specific segment is from an eBay listing for an i7 Sandy Bridge Dell Optiplex 990 Mini Tower. Basically, this is the business tower that would have been sold several years ago with the Sandy Bridge i7 in it. It's interesting because the i5 version of these Dell Towers seems to be what shows up in the videos by folks like Greenham Gaming and the rest of them that are like, oh, look at my console killer. I bought a second-hand computer on eBay and paired it up with a modern graphics card and power supply, and this thing smokes the Xbox One. Oh, yeah. I know what I'm doing with computers now. <laughs> and it was always the i5-2400 version of this. But the 2600, even if you never upgrade to a Sandy Bridge K-series i7, is nothing to sneeze at. If I look at the CPU hierarchy on Novabench, the 6700K that I invested in last summer scores in the, in the nines as far as the CPU score goes, like 900 something. The Sandy Bridge, that old, outdated processor, the 2600K is, well, let's go find it here. The 2600K is 801. Now, actually, I, there is a search box. Why don't I just use the search box? <laughs> the original 2600 is 745. For reference, my overclocked 1090T is 6-something, 5-something if dropped down to stock. And with the Sandy Bridge i7s, the TDP came down below 100 watts with the Intels. Whereas the older Intel i7s from the original generation were 100-something, these things went to 95 watts. And nowadays, the Skylake i7 that I roll with nowadays is a 91-watt TDP. And I imagine that might start dropping as things get more efficient in the years to come. But basically, 
The modern Intel processor that we know of nowadays pretty much began with the Sandy Bridge. Although for money, uh, money, money, what the monetary reasons and budget related reasons. Hey, money, how you doing, man? <laughs> Even with, with budget related reasons and things like that, I often see the i5 because, oh, challenge, build a computer below this price point, blah, blah, blah. But. If I was going to buy a Sandy Bridge, it would probably be the i7 in that series, even if it was the non-K version. Because if you're if you're looking at the i7s, the the i7 2400, uh, i7 24, uh, the i the i5 2400. I'm looking again on this thing here. The i5 2400 is only 443 versus seven something for the 2700, the i7. And when you consider the K version brings you to, brings you to 800, and today's Sandy Bridges are at nine something. And then, of course, factor in the whole thing with you don't need a powerful processor to game, and it's little wonder that folks are trying to build these console killers out of these Sandy Bridge towers. I finally understand it now. You know, this is where this cult following for the Intel Sandy Bridge is coming from, because if you poke around on eBay and you know where to look in terms of corporate surplus, you pick up a Sandy Bridge machine, pair it with an RX 460 or something like that, and even if you pay full price for a regular retail Windows license instead of rolling the dice on one of those gray market sites out there, even if you... you know, Eventually, you do when you're basically going to end up with the cost of a console bundle to get into PC gaming that way. Not a bad deal, if I do say so myself. And the Sandy Bridge is still a respectable chip, particularly if you get the K series and overclock it. Actually, I consider these corporate surplus towers to be the buy the box way to get into Sandy Bridge gaming. However, if I wanted the absolute best Sandy Bridge machine out there, I would actually look for a secondhand gaming PC that someone built themselves. But I, I'd have a feeling, though, with how overclockable and how much the Sandy Bridge can still play ball, especially the i7, that if someone does have a system like that, the odds are they probably don't want to get rid of it anytime soon. And what this really does is this really kind of throws a wrench into the whole you don't need a powerful processor to game prevailing internet wisdom floating around out there. Yes, you don't need a powerful processor to game. But when you're putting your hardware together, go nutso on the processor side of things when you're building, but then when upgrade time rolls around, then go nutso with the graphics card. Because look what happened with the Sandy Bridge. This is a second generation Intel from the very beginning of this decade. And you can, and people are still making this play 1080p games around the 60 FPS mark with the right overclock and the right power supply upgrade and the right graphics card from you know, the, the right modern graphics card. If you can find something with a graphics card slot, like these old corporate surplus business mini towers, then you can actually make a gaming PC out of an old Sandy Bridge off of eBay like this. So imagine if you built an enthusiast Sandy Bridge machine with an i7 K series back in those days. And now we are, here we are nowadays, you can just keep swapping graphics cards. You probably get two or three graphics card swaps before the processor started to fall behind. I mean, you really have to start going into maybe 4K or something like that or beyond 1080p. But if you still have 1080p equipment around, you can get decent gaming performance even out of a Sandy Bridge. Now you consider what what I went through with the Phenom 2 1090T, the beast that that turned out to be, that I was having a hard time justifying retiring it back when I built Monolith last summer. Sandy Bridge is that times 11. Could I have been any more frustrated than I was when I swapped out that 1090T and had a hard time justifying doing so and had to jump up to i7 6700K to make the leap worth it? Yes, I could have been a lot more frustrated if I had a Sandy Bridge. <laughs> That's where the cult following for these old processors is coming from. It's They're all over eBay. They're all over the corporate surplus world. If you know where to look, you can snag a system that basically will work for 1080p gaming for the foreseeable future. Just keep adding graphics cards. And this, of course, throws a wrench into that prevailing wisdom that, oh, yeah, you don't need a powerful processor to game. Get a powerful processor when you're building your system and then emphasize graphics cards afterwards. You could probably get a couple of graphics card swaps in in the time it takes that processor to start struggling with games. Very, very interesting, especially when you're talking about people trying to put together something that that matches or exceeds what consoles can do. And they're looking on eBay in the Sandy Bridge section in order to do so. Well, you know what? I was wondering why these processors had such a cult following. I think I know now. 
<laughs> yeah, and uh, it's very interesting watching these Sandy Bridge gaming videos on here where people are, oh, look at my old Sandy Bridge, can still do 1080 60 with a modern graphics card. Ain't it something? <laughs> uh, yeah, ain't it something? Look at what happened. This processor came out at the very beginning of this decade. We're now heading towards the latter part of this decade, and you can still use it. There's your answer on when to emphasize the CPU side of a gaming rig. That is, when you're first putting everything together and then emphasize the graphics card for upgrades. Maybe you get something mid-range when that starts to mess up on you, then you can look to upgrade later on or something like that. But definitely, you want to emphasize the CPU when you're starting with a brand new box. Because look what happened to Sandy Bridge. <laughs> So very, it's very, very interesting. I think I'm going to do some more digging around YouTube later on to see what exactly people are doing with Sandy Bridge systems these days and exactly how long they're running them into the ground. Matter of fact, it makes me kind of depressed that the Potato Masher project over on Germ Gaming's channel is an original generation i5. I can, I'm just curious. Somebody out there who has a 2600K or even one of these Dell towers, the i7 version, I'm very curious how long that remains a relevant gaming system when paired with a modern graphics card. Even if it seems like, oh, I'm going to bottleneck things because of the old processor. Consider this. The graphics card can go with you to a better computer when you're done messing around with, let's see how far the Sandy Bridge goes. Not so much the case with the RAM or the motherboard that came with this thing. And that's the thing, too. The, the movable upgrades is something to consider. Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to see what I can do with this Sandy Bridge. And when I get some more money, then I'll put together something that won't, you know, won't bottleneck this graphics card. And that is actually quite a valid thing to do. But I'm very, very curious. If someone has an i7 version of this Dell Mini Tower, I'm actually curious how much they, how long they can run that sucker into the ground. Because in terms of Dellasauruses, this is the most interesting one by far. So now that I understand the cult of the whole Sandy Bridge thing, it's almost game time here in the U.S., so I'm going to call it here. Thanks for listening, everybody. Till next time, this is Multimedia J signing off. Thanks for stopping by.